Hi, dudes and dames, and welcome. As many probably noticed, the talk on the events in Syria has taken a slight turn off track, to say the least. There were a couple of things I found to be rather disturbing in this whole matter, and I'll attempt to show you why. Here I wanna make absolutely clear to everyone, I am no big fan of Putin, nor of Assad, nor of any of the western leaders. But what is going on right now leads nowhere fast. It has long been well known that individuals in the US along with several other nations aid all the wrong so-called rebel groups using the cover that these groups are going to fight ISIS and other really shady reasonings for weird actions done like weapon drops in rebel controlled areas etc. The deal here is obvious and simple. They supply their assistance through UN, military, weaponry and financing and the rebels take down Assad. So Syria can become the next country handed over to the Islamic State and several other bonus effects can be achieved. Problem here is, if you are someone who wants to appear to have some sort of integrity and you do business with people who only see integrity as an obstacle, they will always have the advantage in that they can just threaten to reveal the cooperation. This of course happened the 16th of September. One of these groups kicked out American special forces from a Syrian border town. It wasn't random, this was recorded and brought to news outlets attention. This was a direct message to the individuals who are supporting them that they are not satisfied with the current assistance. This is an alleged video of the incident that surfaced online. Rebels reportedly belonging to a group backed by the US are heard chanting anti-American slogans. The US forces reportedly crossed the Turkish border into Syria as part of an operation to coordinate airstrikes against ISIL. However, it seems they decided to return back to Turkey after Syrian rebels furiously protested against their presence in the area. The rebels were chanting anti-American slogans as well as threatening the troops with violence. The Pentagon, obviously, as you said, hasn't yet uh, responded to the vi the, these videos that have uh, emerged. But they have, of course, confirmed that they do have special operations forces accompanying uh, Turkish military forces and Turkish-backed rebels in northern Syria around the al Rai area where uh, these videos emerged from and further east uh, in Jarablus. And this is likely to be very embarrassing for the United States. Uh, free Syrian army fighters, the so-called moderate rebels that the Americans and the Turks have been uh, insisting for years now are the acceptable opposition in Syria, uh, openly calling for the slaughter of American forces. Uh, furthermore, the incident really highlights the difficulty Americans have been having in identifying moderate Syrian rebels. Uh, the U.S. has spent over a billion dollars each year uh, since about 2011, 2012 to develop a moderate Syrian opposition. And this has been, it's been worse than wasted money. Not, not only have we been unable to find uh, effective rebel fighters for us, but in many cases, the ones identified as moderate, uh, especially those from the Free Syrian Army, have defected to the Al-Qaeda affiliate there, Nusra, or even to Islamic State. So the fact that this Free Syrian Army group, which is known in the United States as among the most moderate of all the rebels, the fact that they would threaten to slaughter Americans really shouldn't actually be that surprising, given their track record. The reason why we haven't been able to find moderate rebels isn't due to a lack of looking. We've looked very, very hard. We wanted to find moderate rebels to both displace Islamic State and Nusra and even to replace the Assad regime. The reason why we haven't been able to work with the rebels is because it turns out that there really aren't that many moderates who are effective fighters. And so I think the problem isn't in our ability to identify the moderates. I think the real problem is 
overall the lack of real moderates. At the time it didn't seem that important, but two days later, on the 18th of September, this was aired. A several year old stronghold position of the Syrian army was very effectively bombed by a US coordinated attack and immediately overrun by the rebels already seizing the position. Now it's important to know that US were never given permission to perform any bombings in Syria at all and anything that have been done by the coalition have been outside of protocols and without proper permissions. So, the Russians call a security meeting to talk about this rather unfortunate event, especially in the light that the American leadership refused to cooperate with Russia on their military effort. Here I'd like you to pay extra attention to how the ambassador chose to react. I suspect I won't have to, but I'm still going to mention. Bringing Fifi talk into deeply serious diplomatic issues will only result in an unproductive outcome. The Russian Defense Ministry has confirmed that US-led coalition planes attacked Syrian forces after entering Syrian airspace from the Iraqi border. We're hearing that there were four strikes, 62 Syrian soldiers were killed and 100 were injured. This position of the Syrian military was surrounded by Islamic State. So after the strikes, Islamic State militants were able to advance forward. Now the Russian Defense Ministry is saying that even if this attack was carried out because of false Ordinates. What it does show is the consequences of the United States' unwillingness to cooperate with Russia on locating targets and coordinating anti terror efforts. Now, there has also been a statement that has been issued by the U.S. Central Command. It says that it believed that this position that it struck was an Islamic State position that it had been tracking for quite some time, and that as soon as it was informed by the Russians and the Syrians that it was possible that it had hit Syrian personnel and Syrian military vehicles, it immediately suspended its operation. The U.S. Army was previously accused of hitting Syrian troops in the same province back in December 2015. Everybody was anticipating uh, Samantha Power, the U.S. ambassador to the U.N. Uh, SC, and her Russian counterpart Vitaly Churkin to uh, take uh, podiums. And uh, Samantha Power was the first one to, I would say, vent her anger publicly, to vent her outrage in front of the media. And when I say outrage, I'm not exaggerating, because she was furious uh, about having to convene about being summoned on Russia's call uh, to discuss uh, the airstrike. And this is something that she didn't really address in her speech properly. She kind of sidelined the whole airstrike thing. Let's actually have a listen as to what she had to say. Russia decided to join the Assad regime, escalating the conflict and, perhaps worst of all, itself adopting some of the regime's worst practices, hitting hospitals, one year ago today, a Doctors Without Borders hospital in Kunduz in Afghanistan was hit by over 200 shells during a now infamous U.S. airstrike. 42 people, including three children, died during the bombardment and 37 were injured. Hitting refugee camps. And they're calling this emergency meeting? Really? Now, because of a single airstrike, a strike that if it struck regime forces did so in error, a strike that we have swiftly acknowledged and committed to investigating. Vitaly Churkin took podium uh, right after his uh, American counterpart and uh, as he revealed that Samantha Power did not hold back on her hard feelings behind closed mm -hmm. doors as well. In fact, by her approach, she managed to surprise even Vitaly Churkin. Uh, let's have a listen to how he describes what happened behind closed doors. As I was talking uh, in the Security Council, sharing our analysis and frustration over the situation of Syria, Ambassador Power chose to talk to you. The only thing her deputy had to say uh, in response to my comments was that the U.S. investigating is investigating what has happened at Darazor. As Ambassador Power walked in, first thing she said, she was not interested in what I, what, what I had to say because what I was saying is a stunt. Where is it again we see this form of behavior? Hmm. 
even though the US could have done this themselves, they decided to have the British, Australian and Danish governments do it for them. Plausible deniability much? Is that this was a mistake that a number of the coalition countries were involved in. We've had that admission from the British. Earlier we heard the Australian president confirming that his country's jets took part in the strike. And the Danish have said that their aircrafts were involved as well. So it's making that ceasefire in Syria look pretty tenuous right now. A former MI5 agent comments the situation. Russia obviously has a greater human intelligence on the ground because it's cooperating, it's working with the, the Syrian authorities. So they have access to proper human intelligence, which is much better than what the Americans tend to use, which is, you know, satellite surveillance and electronic surveillance. So one would hope that this would increase their cooperation. I mean, this is a very fragile time. It's the, the week of a trial truce. If this truce holds, then they will both cooperate more closely to go after ISIS. Having said that, um, I find it slightly unbelievable that the Americans could hit uh, this target thinking it was uh, ISIS, when in fact ISIS is, is laying siege to the city and the Syrian forces for years now have been known to be holed up in that city. So it seems rather strange that the Americans are just saying it's a bit of a mistake. The Russian uh, foreign ministry also saying the US didn't mm. actually inform them of any plans uh, to conduct that operation in Deir Ezzor, which goes against uh, obviously uh, what we would be led to believe by uh, the CENTCOM statement there. Um, Annie, Russia and US obviously, uh, as we said earlier, are working to improve cooperation in Syria, but some senior US politicians seem to be opposed to that. Let's just take a quick listen before we get back to you on this statement from Ash Carter. I've said before that we believe Russia has the wrong strategy. Despite what the Russians say, we have not agreed to cooperate with Russia. As you know, we are not coordinating on a military-to-military -military basis um, with the Russians. That has not changed. Given that CENTCOM has said that uh, the airstrike was actually halted um, when coalition officials were informed by the Russians that uh, Syrian army units were present, I I'm starting to think if some cooperation on the ground had taken place before this, this whole situation could have been avoided. What do you think the prospects actually are um, of a joint cooperation, given the quite, uh, well, lukewarm rhetoric, to say the best, from US officials on this matter? Well, I think we have a truce here where uh, Russia has a relationship with the democratically elected Syrian government and it is an ally and it has certainly intervened already militarily to support that ally in the war against uh, the terrorist insurgents. America, though, the, I, I get the sense it's slightly divided. We have a, some of the military that really believe that actually they need to go after ISIS, that's the threat to the whole West, they want to work with Russia, and yet there's still this hawkish neocon political approach um, which really still wants to just get rid of Assad for other strategic reasons like supporting American allies like Qatar and Al uh, Saudi Arabia in the Middle East. So the Americans seem to be a little divided on this. Now I am wondering particularly because there was a very notorious interview given by the former acting director of uh, the CIA I think a month ago, Michael Morell, where he said that um, he's supporting Hillary Clinton, he's obviously a Democrat, and he was advocating the assassination of Iranian and Russian uh, support on the ground in Syria. Yeah. And also, he was um, advocating the bombing of Assad, not to kill him, but to scare him. So I'm wondering if there are elements within the US uh, power structure that are actually going ahead with this sort of plan and bombing Assad's military um, forces to scare him, to scare the Russians, to, you know, just try and make a point. Um, and they're actually carrying this out already, rather than this just being a sort of wish list from the former uh, acting director of the CIA. Mm. Uh, we, we covered a story earlier uh, also, Annie, I don't know if you heard about the alleged um, withdrawal of some US Special Forces commandos from a Syrian town uh, on the Turkish border, allegedly being um, hassled by uh, US-backed rebels 
as they went and we've had some guests on the program expressing uh, an opinion uh, previously that uh, such airstrikes even though on the surface of, 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 of things they are accidental and that is certainly what the Pentagon has said that it wasn't intentional um, that such uh, actions may be uh, perhaps an appeasement of the uh, so-called moderate rebels who the US is kind of lo losing control of to start with uh, you know, to start with, they were used as a, as a weapon against Assad, and now they're simply out of control. Um, is, is that a, a valid point, perhaps, that they are um, doing this sort of stuff to try to get these rebels back on side? That would be the other interpretation, rather than this uh, airstrike being a mistake. It is indeed to reassure the so-called moderates um, who are being funded and, and helped and armed and, and uh, assisted by the Americans. So I think that is a very valid point indeed, because the, the news that American special forces were being driven back, being run out of town by so-called moderate allied groups right next to the border of Turkey was deeply, deeply humiliating for the US. So um, if indeed this was a planned airstrike and it was indeed there to reassure these so-called moderate groups, that would make sense. Unfortunately, of course, we've seen over the last five years that these so-called moderate groups, time after time after time, will go over to the immoderate side. They will go over to the ISIS side or uh, al-Nusra or uh, Fatah al-Sham as it's now called. So, you know, it's very difficult for America. They're, they are playing with fire. It's a bit like their funding of the Mujahideen in Afghanistan in the 1980s against the Soviet forces. Then we have the attack on the aid convoy. And on the 20th, this footage of the militants following the aid convoy is aired on RG. On the 21st, Larov and Kerry presents their case in the UN. And to me, it says everything anyone needs to know about this Syrian affair. Thank you, Mr. President. Distinguished Secretary General, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's clear that the Middle East and North Africa region is uh, experiencing uh, serious troubles due to interethnic, uh, interconfessional, and other uh, clashes uh, and expressions of extremism, terrorism. Uh, Iraq, Yemen, Libya, Syria uh, are in the throes of uh, crises. Other countries are also. Uh, uh, in very difficult situations, including in the African continent, and a further deterioration of the situation could be a serious threat to international peace and stability. More than once it has been stated that this situation is a direct consequence of uh, the terrible practice of geopolitical engineering and uh, the interference in the internal affairs of sovereign states, uh, ch attempts to change uh, regimes, including through the use of force. Now, uh, the situation in Syria is is particularly concerning. From the very start of the Syrian crisis, Russia has always been in favor of a, pure, a purely peaceful solution to the crisis while uh, preserving uh, the sovereignty and territorial integrity of this ancient country. We continue to uh, be convinced that there is no alternative to a political process based on uh, mutually uh, respectful, inclusive, uh, intra-Syrian dialogue without any preconditions while ensuring uh, a uh, cessation of hostilities, expansion of humanitarian access, and enhancing the effectiveness of the fight against terrorism. This kind of uh, uh, comprehensive position is enshrined in the decisions of the International Syria Support Group and in the resolutions of the uh, Security Council, first and foremost in Resolution 2254. And I want to, uh, in particular, mention that within as part of these uh, American-Russian agreements, it, it's underscored that the key priority is to separate the uh, opposition forces from the terrorists of ISIS and Jabhat al-Nusra in order to effectively ensure the cessation of hostilities regime in order to resolve humanitarian issues and what's most important, to put an end to efforts by terrorists to escape punishment and justice by uh, using the cover of their cooperation uh, with so-called moderate participants of the cessation of hostilities regime. The agreements entered into force on the 12th of September. 
Once again, I repeat that their absence in, uh, in, in the public domain uh, doesn't make it possible to, to, to check what, uh, certain aspects. But I just want to mention that these uh, agreements uh, uh, mention the need to ensure humanitarian deliveries through the Castella Road. And for that, it was mentioned that the government uh, and the opposition that uh, controlled various sectors of that road should withdraw their forces on at, at an equal distance from the road, and that distance was specifically mentioned in those agreements. The government forces began withdrawing their forces as uh, required in accordance with the uh, U.S.-American agreements, but only to see that the opposition did not act similarly, uh, reciprocally, but in fact started shelling government forces. And this happened more than once. And the opposition forces have still not withdrawn their units from the Castella Road as demanded in accordance with the 9 September agreements. Uh, overall, we uh, through our Ministry of Defense, have uh, uh, ensured a, a constant monitoring of what is going on uh, along the Castella Road and uh, around Aleppo. And on the website of our Ministry of Defense, the Russian Ministry of Defense, it's very clear of who is complying with the agreements and who isn't. A clear violation of the cessation of hostilities regime were the strikes on the 16th of September by the coalition against positions of the government forces of Deir el-Azor. And immediately after those strikes, ISIS began an assault against government forces. On the 19th of September, another unacceptable provocation occurred. I'm talking about uh, uh, an attack against the humanitarian convoy uh, in an area under the control of the opposition. I just wanted to mention that on the same day, on the 19th of September, in that same area, in the so-called uh, Ramusa Road, uh, a very aggressive uh, attack was carried out by al-Nusra and their allies against government forces. As a result, the jihadists managed to make progress in the 1070 uh, region or portion. Now, I am sure, I don't have any proof, but I'm sure that these kinds of coincidences require serious analysis and investigation. And we insist uh, on a very thorough and uh, impartial investigation of the attack on the humanitarian convoy. Many said that it could have been a, a, a rocket or an artillery or, sh or artillery shelling, that was uh, what the initial reports were, then uh, helicopters or, or warplanes were mentioned. So I think we need to refrain from emotional uh, reactions and make comments immediately, uh, public comments, but first to investigate and be very professional. I just wanted to mention that the distance from the uh, point of the incident and uh, the epicenter of, uh, of uh, clashes in the center of Aleppo, where uh, where the terrorists are fighting is no more than five to seven kilometers. Now, Russia has provided all information that it has regarding uh, the attack against this convoy, including uh, video, in, in real-time video, of uh, when this actually happened in, in drafting Resolution 2254, proposed including in the list of terrorist organizations together with another group, Jaysh al-Islam, and our partners at the time said that this will not make it possible for us to work in an effective way, and as a, a gesture of good faith, we decided not to insist on that, and we limited the terrorist list to Jab Jabhat al-Nusra and the so-called uh, Islamic State. Well, the leadership of al-Asrar al-Sham, after the uh, declaration of entry into force of the cessation of hostilities agreement on the 12th of September, officially stated that it will not abide by these agreements because these agreements uh, mention al-Nusra as a terrorist organization, and Ahrar al-Asham does not consider al-Nusra as such and closely works with it. So I believe that the time has come to think about revisiting this list of terrorist organizations. At the end, I'd like to say that 
we have always put as a top priority the resumption of the inter-Syrian political dialogue without any preconditions as demanded by Resolution 2254 with the participation of representatives of all ethnic and confessional groups to uh, implement the roadmap that is contained in Resolution 2254 and which should lead to a solution to the Syrian crisis within, as we had hoped at the time, uh, 18 months. Otherwise, we will not be able to achieve a lasting solution and to and to preserve Syria as a, as a, a, a single united uh, state, uh, restore the economy, ensure the return of refugees, etc. We support the efforts of the Special Envoy Stefan de Mistura, and we call on on everyone to continue, or on him to continue working with the the uh, parties to the conflict to ensure the continuity and the inclusive character of the negotiating process. Attempts by uh, certain participants to put forward preconditions or ultimatums to sabotage Resolution 2254 are unacceptable. But unfortunately, such attempts have continued. And the UN special envoy should not should not uh, accept this kind of uh, uh, blackmail. Uh, negotiations should resume, and it, those who insist on preconditions, sh they should be told that these demands are counter uh, are counter to the demands of this body, the Security Council of the United Nations. We will contribute in every way to the efforts of Stefan de Mistura, including by working with everyone, without any, uh, without excluding anyone, with the, uh, the, the, the Syrian government and all uh, members of the opposition. Thank you very much. Mr. President, uh, good morning, <clears throat> and good morning to all of our colleagues here on the United Nations uh, Security Council. Uh, I want to thank my colleague from New Zealand, particularly for hosting this very important session on the crisis in Syria. Um, and I think it's appropriate that we are gathering here couple of rooms over from where yesterday so many heads of state came together in what I thought was a remarkably moving and eloquent statement of the consequence of this war in Syria. Uh, I listened to King Abdullah particularly uh, talk about the impact on his country of these millions of people who are distorting their economy putting huge pressures on the social structure of their country, uh, living under the worst circumstances, and in some areas preventing a uh, threat because of the ability of Daesh, ISIS to, or Nusra to slip people in uh, and present a security threat to a country. Uh, we listen to the young Olympian tell us about uh, her dreams and how she was able to compete this year because of a refugee Olympic team. And we saw the images in a beautifully Bono narrated video that uh, really made us think about the consequences of this. And I hope everybody will come here today really focused on these consequences and not engage in word games that duck responsibility or avoid the choices that this great institution has in front of it with respect to war and peace, life and death. Um, I listened to my colleague from Russia and, and I sort of felt a little bit like they're sort of in a parallel universe here. Um, he said that nobody should have any preconditions to come to the table. Well, we met in Vienna twice. We met here in New York and embraced a United Nations Security Council resolution. We met again in Munich. 
and in each place. The International Syria Support Group and here in the Security Council, the Security Council embraced a ceasefire applicable to all parties. That's not a precondition. That's an international agreement. Four times arrived at, four times countries have said, we will do this. And four times it's been shredded by independent actors, by spoilers who don't want a ceasefire. So this is not a precondition. How can people go sit at a table with a regime that bombs hospitals and drops chlorine gas again and again and again and again and again and again and acts with impunity? You're supposed to sit there and have happy talk in Geneva under those circumstances when you've signed up to a ceasefire and you don't adhere to it? What kind of credibility do you have with any of your people? It's not a precondition. It's something we all agreed on in the United Nations and in the International Syria Support Group. And I have to say, the documents which we're prepared to release, we've told people, we announced that yesterday at the International Syria Support Group. People in the support group have the documents. But you don't need to read these documents to understand it's against international law to bomb hospitals. You don't need these documents to understand that you don't drop barrel bombs on children. These are flagrant violations of international law. So I don't want to obfuscate this process, folks. I didn't come here this morning to do that. Supposedly, we all want the same goal. I've heard that again and again. Russia, Iran, the United States, Qatar, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, everybody sits there and says, we want a united Syria, secular, respecting the rights of all people, in which the people of Syria can choose their leadership. But we are proving woefully inadequate in our ability to be able to get to the table and have that conversation and make it happen. And let's face it, everybody in this room understands that there are proxies at this table and proxies outside of this room, and we know who they are, who have the ability to have an impact on the players in this conflict that has provided the greatest humanitarian catastrophe since World War II. So uh, let's, let's just review the bidding a bit. You know, I was privileged to serve in the United States Senate with a fellow who spent a lot of time here. He was the ambassador to the United Nations, Daniel Patrick Moynihan. And he would famously remind us that everyone is entitled to their own opinion, but you are not entitled to your own facts. And as President John Adams once said, facts are stubborn things. So I don't think we can let anybody here, if we're going to deal with this situation, have their own set of facts about Syria. Everybody here understands the depth of human tragedy. Everybody, I mean, the words are getting, you know, you wonder why people in various parts of the world are so angry about governance. It's because all they hear are words. And we know how many times we've demanded action and it doesn't take place. So I want to share some facts with you this morning. Facts. Last night, we have reports of airstrikes that hit a medical facility near Aleppo, and four aid workers were killed, despite the fact there's supposed to be a cessation. There are only two countries that have airplanes that are flying during the night or flying at all in that particular area, Russia and Syria. On Monday, and Sergei just said, well, let's examine the facts and see what happened. On Monday, 20 aid workers were killed in an outrageous, sustained, 
two-hour attack directed at a fully authorized humanitarian mission near Aleppo, fully authorized. All of the permits had been given. Everybody was on notice. Now, this attack has dealt a very heavy blow to our efforts to bring peace to Syria, and it raises a profound doubt about whether Russia and the Assad regime can or will live up to the obligations that they agreed to in Geneva. It also raises questions, not this attack, but other events raise questions about some of the opposition. Those are facts. And the simple reality is we cannot resolve this crisis if the major parties who come to the table and agree to do something are unwilling to do what's necessary to avoid escalation. Olympics, really, he's talking to the Security Council, not a bunch of voters. And their claim that Russia didn't provide any proof, I think it is pretty clear who attacked the aid convoy. I mean, even the day before they air the aid convoy followed by militants. It should be obvious to most people that a lot of the people handling this situation in not only the US but the UK is anything but willing to have the rebels taken out and peace restored in that region. Here's a little goodie that was aired on the 27th. The jihadists fighting in Syria are not satisfied with the help the US and its allies are providing them. That's according to an al-Nusra front commander who gave an interview to a German journalist. Yes, the US supports the opposition, but not directly. They support the countries that back us. However, we are still not satisfied with this support. They should support us with advanced weapons. We were winning the fights thanks to Tau missiles. With these, we gained parity with the regime. We received tanks from Libya via Turkey and multiple rocket launching systems too. The regime's only advantage is tactical aircraft, rockets and rocket launchers. We captured some of the rocket launchers and received a lot from abroad. Thanks to the Tau missiles, we are able to keep the situation under control in many areas. According to the al-Nusra commander, the jihadists don't recognize the ceasefire in Syria and they're only using it to regroup. He also told the German media that U.S. instructors arrived to teach the radicals how to use this new state-of-the-art equipment. We got the missiles directly. They were delivered to a certain group. When the road was closed and was encircled, we had officers from Turkey, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Israel and the U.S. here. Doing what? They were experts, experts on how to use satellites, missiles, reconnaissance operations and thermal observation cameras. Also American advisors? Yes, there were experts from many countries. Also American? Yes. Yeah, well, to be honest, I don't know much about the coverage of this from the Western media. But seeing that today they are heavily working on the narrative and sentiment needed for starting this thing with Russia to get us set out, I could imagine it is somewhat cherry-picked. Do I like Assad? No. But he is democratically elected. Should he be taken out? No. Handing over Syria to Islamic State would be brain dead. And starting shit with Russia to do it would be even more brain dead. I can't help but thinking, what about we clean house before pointing fingers of how others run theirs? Lately, reality hints that we are the ones who really have a problem. Thanks for watching.